Hi everybody, so glad that you came back from lunch. Hopefully you're not too tired. I'm a little tired myself. Um, that's all right. So I'm so excited to be here and um, what I'm gonna talk about is maybe just a little bit different than open source. However, I can tell you where it fits in all the pieces. But before that, I'll do a little bit of an introduction. My name is uh, Robin Yeeman. I currently work at Carnegie Mellon, the Software Engineering Institute, uh, as the space domain lead. Uh, prior to that, I spent 28 years working at Lockheed Martin. Um, I retired as a senior technical fellow, um, and I had the opportunity to work pretty much, I, I always tell people, everything from submarines to satellites, uh, so a whole range. Um, I began as a software engineer, so I spent most of my career as a software engineer, um, but then transitioned into systems because most of the things Lockheed builds are pretty big. How many of you guys have heard of Lockheed Martin? Okay, so a few. Um, so what I want to talk about is, is uh, applying Agile and DevSecOps beyond software, right? How do I bring it together for the system? And one of the things that I ran into pretty frequently is if we did a great job and we were able to get the software out fast, it still didn't mean that I got my systems out fast, right? My customers still didn't experience anything different. So the key is being able to bring these together. Now, over the last couple decades, we've seen some pretty good things with, with Agile and DevOps. Would you guys agree? Right? We've got higher morale, better visibility, faster progress, all kinds of great things. What I wanna do, or what I'm most interested in, is how do I take those great things that happened at the software level and bring them all the way up to the system level? Right? How, do I, how do I do that? And before we go anywhere with that, why? Why do you think we'd wanna do that? Uh, do we wanna do that because it sounds cool? Or, you know, it's a great buzzword? Nah, it's, it doesn't even have generative AI in it. It's not a good buzzword, right? So the reason you want to do that is because traditional development, traditional systems development, waterfall, operates very well, let's say, in a simple domain, right? Pretty simple. I'm repeating things that I've built before multiple times. However, most things that we're building today are complicated and complex, right? And that is where Agile thrives. So um, things like the F-35, right? Their, their lines of code is going through the roof. Um, Orion, the, uh, you know, the space vehicle, um, things like satellites, etc. highly complex. And when I start putting a lot of them together, they have what we would call emergent behavior, all right? So, so there's a lot going on. And that is why I would want to move from a traditional kind of uh, waterfall approach to an agile approach leveraging DevSecOps principles. Now, how many of you guys have heard of the waterfall? How many of you have had an opportunity to read the paper by Winston Royce that first instantiated the waterfall. <laughs> That's good. Now, the interesting thing about that paper is he worked at Lockheed, 1970. He was in uh, Burbank, California. And you don't even have to turn the page before he says, I would never use this approach for anything larger than three months without 100% well understood requirements. So, Fast forward to me, beginning at Lockheed in the early 90s, um, and I spent probably three years building requirements for a submarine before we did any code, before we did any design, before we did any development, right? So I, I, I think this. I believe that we're all so busy that we had time to look at the picture, and we're like, yes, but not time to read the whole 20-page paper. Um, so that's kind of what I think happened. All right, motivation to migrate. Demand for faster development. I gotta think just like in the States, you guys need products 
faster. Um, we need to be able to manage change and then really handle this increased complexity. One of the things I see pretty regularly, uh, my children are, are both graduating from uh, University of Central Florida. One's in computer science, one's in biochemistry. And their degree looks exactly the same as my degree looked like almost 30 years ago um, in computer science coming out of Syracuse University. I believe they're being educated for last generation's problems, not necessarily for this generation. And I honestly think that um, in order to build these systems faster and to handle the complexity, the answers are gonna be in the liminal space, right? So the subject matter expertise of just software, or just systems, or just test um, is probably not going to, to meet the need that we're looking at. And we got some early adopters, early innovators, right? Those of us, you know, you've seen some of these guys, SpaceX, heard of them, right? Um, Planet Labs, I'm a huge fan. They actually launch satellites every three or four months, which is really fast. Um, Bosch, Formula One, Relativity, which actually has one of the largest 3D printers in the world. Now, both them and SpaceX say they have the largest 3D printer. I don't know who's right. I haven't actually gone to visit, but they're both claiming that. And Tesla, right? So these are what we would call those early adopters and they've really taken off. So what we wanna do is make sure we can do that for the rest of our systems. Otherwise, uh, we're all gonna be working for the same 10 companies in, in 10 years, right? Because they're, they're just killing it. Now, recently, uh, a, a colleague of mine and myself, we published a book. It's called Industrial DevOps, hence the name of the topic. Um, and it may not be the best title. It was the one that came up at the time, and so we've kept it. Um, but it really is about how you apply agile and DevSecOps to safety-critical cyber-physical systems, mostly large-scale. So things like fighter jets, submarines, space vehicles, etc. All right. And based upon the, the book, we actually found maybe eight or nine principles, nine that we have here, um, that we found pretty successful repeatedly on programs. She's from Northrop Grumman. I'm from, or I was from Lockheed Martin. It's hard to stop saying that. After 28 years, when you're with a place, like you just always forever kind of associate yourself with them. So I'm gonna walk you through these principles. And my goal is, you know, for you to ask questions, maybe give you uh, thought, um, things to, to think about, even if you have areas that you wanna push back. Nope, that, that won't work. Um, any of those things are, are on the table. All right. Make sure I'm on time here. All right, first one. Organize for the flow of value. Organize around value. Uh, what does that mean? Well, uh, many of the programs that I've worked over the years, we have very large stove pipes within our organization. So I'll have software engineers, I'll have systems engineers, I will have mechanical engineers, hardware, electronics, etc. All all completely separated, trying to build business outcomes. And then what happens is we actually have to come together to deliver the system. The other problem that we see with these large stovepipes is communication follows the org structure, meaning everybody in the software realm, the soft, they, they know the software speak and they know what's going on in the software organization but not necessarily across, right? The goal of most of my customers is how do I get a satellite into orbit in less than 60 months, right? That's, which is a long time, but that would be the goal of many of my, my uh, customers. Some of the problems we also have with these organizations is, you know, we've got program managers. They're speaking in things like lean, lean startup, great. Uh, systems engineers, they're talking about systems thinking, maybe design thinking. Software, referring to things like agile, 
DevOps. Um, operations, they're talking about things like ITIL or IT infrastructure library. Here's the secret. Each one of those things is actually about trying to deliver an optimized system and we're all talking past each other. So I had this great experience just before I, I left Lockheed and, and they figured it out, right? They're, they're smart folks, but um, we had a brand new uh, missile contract and you know we had to go fast, right? You've heard that. We're, we're, by the time we start, we're already late. So we had to go fast. And on day one, you had your systems engineers going off and getting reusable documents, reusable artifacts. We had our digital twin folks going off and getting a digital shadow to begin with. We had our modeling and simulation engineers getting reusable models. And our software team downloading an existing code base to begin from. Now the interesting thing is, they all picked a different missile because we don't talk across organizations. And when we have programs with thousands of people, this happens pretty regularly. Um, wouldn't it be great if we had all picked the same one? Now again, like I said, they're gonna, they're gonna get there. So one of the biggest things we wanna do is make sure that we organize around value. And that's not around the functions, that's how I get a system into the hands of a user. Here's a good example. I stole this from Scaled Agile, but you know, I could have built one just like it. Up at the top, you're looking at the operational value stream. Notice that the operational value stream doesn't say requirements, software, design, no. It has all of those capabilities that we need to do. And then we've got what we would refer to as the development value streams. The development value stream is typically that value stream that's feeding the operational. So perhaps you're purchasing a vehicle, right? Your operational value stream is, I want a vehicle, I procured it, I have a vehicle. It's a really short value stream, but that would be it. Um, the development value stream would perhaps be the people who are building the transfer case for your truck, or they're building you know, your infotainment system. Those are development value streams that are feeding the system for that overall vehicle. All right, next one, multiple horizons of planning. Now, many of our programs, especially if you have been big into Agile, how many of you guys have done a little bit of Agile? Um, they're looking at planning for two week sprints, or maybe they're planning for a quarter. Uh, Fleet Ballistic Missile is a 60 year program that, that Lockheed Martin has, right? I can't plan two weeks at a time to build that. I need to plan much longer. Um, so typically for a large program, I might have a five year plan, and I break that down into an annual plan, and I'll break that down into a quarterly plan, and then I'll break that down into a sprint plan and a daily plan. Now some of you may say, what is the difference between that and an integrated master schedule? Well, an integrated master schedule is a predictive plan and basically one of the things that typically happens for an integrated master schedule that I've built out for five years is your program managers are gonna beat people to get back on plan, but keep in mind you built this plan when you knew the least amount about the system. So we wanna move to empirical planning. And empirical planning is, okay, so I have this five-year plan, but I have regular review points. Now, if I'm looking at my daily plan, and I planned to, let's say, complete 10 things today, and I completed seven, it's pretty likely that my two-week plan is also going to be about that 70% complete. Uh, there's usually not a case where we magically catch up. So what we wanna do is take that data, and maybe I wouldn't take it from an individual day, but if I did have a couple of sprints where I was 70% complete, I would use that data to further inform the next horizon of planning so that I can be predictable. Now, I can either do any of the things that I would typically do in that that iron triangle, I can add resources, I can change my schedule, 
I can add automation, any of those things, but I need to do something because it's likely that we're, we're not going to hit that predictability mark. Now here's an example. This is Orion, right? So Orion has a series of experiments, right? Big things that they're gonna do, and currently this is the plan to get to Mars by 2030. But based upon things that we learn along the way, this may be adjusted. We're not going to just wait till 2030 and go, oops, I didn't make it. You've got a series of experiments. You're going to use that empirical data to feed back into your plan so that we can actually get to a predictable system. The next thing I want to do is really look at implementing data-driven decisions. Now, data-driven decisions is not decisions that I make based upon looking at paper. It's decisions that I make based upon looking at an executable system. Now, maybe I don't have the hardware for the rocket yet. Um, maybe I don't have all of the components complete and I have to mock out areas. Um, but I want to demonstrate my work, not just paper, every single uh, time box, every single, whether it's a sprint, a, a larger quarter, a, an annual, I want people to actually look at a real system and use that data to determine what we need to do, what, what progress was, all right? Typically, this isn't happening. Now, the cool thing is we have even better tools that are getting better and better all the time. So we've got simulators, we've got emulators, digital shadows, digital twins, digital threads, 3D printers, all kinds of things that allow us to get to fast feedback. Things that we might not have been able to do maybe 10 years ago, we can now, right? Um, I heard this morning, which I won't take back to anybody, but I heard this morning, um, he said, oh, the difference between hardware and software is hardware is slower. Well, <laughs> it is a physical product, right? So we're, we're not gonna, we're not gonna you know, make fun of our hardware brethren, but we do want to tell them that there's digital mechanisms now that can actually validate and get us information. So the old way of building doesn't have to stay the same. Um, here's an example, um, the VC25B program from Boeing, the Heinz schedule, right? And they've demonstrated and seen variants multiple times, and there's multiple reasons, but the fact is that they're looking at it, right? They're not looking at just the paper. Um, I actually have a couple friends that work at Boeing and um, they have some pretty good data about it. This is not new, you guys know this. this. We need to do this in software, but we have to do it in hardware too, right? Architect for change in speed. We need modularity and standardized interfaces. It looked like, and I got a chance to sit in the um, software defined vehicle portion of the Linux uh, conference yesterday. And, and it looks like they're making huge strides in exactly this. Typically, a lot of our larger systems, the satellites, stuff like that, that, that I've built, they're all one-offs, right? They're, they're constantly, it's not product line engineering, it's not standardized, but it could be, right? And if we did that, then we can commoditize the things we know and innovate on those things that we don't, but much faster, all right? So let's make sure that we're, we're using this modular architecture, both within the software and the hardware. Here's an example. Um, this is SmartSat from uh, Lockheed Martin. So just like you got software-defined vehicles, software-defined satellite. Uh, it came out, I wanna say about four years ago um, and it's used on a multiple, uh, multiple sets of satellites. But the cool thing about this, just like a vehicle, is I can change the mission from weather to intelligence over the air anytime, right? It's ultimate, ultimate flexibility um, in being able to, you know, change what it's doing, all right? So this would be a good example of a modular architecture software defined that gives us maximum flexibility to make changes when we need it.
iterate and manage queues. This is not new. Um, the theory of constraints has been around a long time. However, um, what I tend to see, especially when we're building systems, is most of my teams are working eight projects and just little piece parts, and we have a lot of work in progress. All right? When I was a kid, I got a chance to work on the assembly line at Chrysler, building transfer cases. Third shift, which is the middle of the night. I absolutely hated it. But, um, you know, one night I came in and we didn't actually have all of the pieces for, for the transfer case. But the line manager, he's not measured on whether we're building transfer cases correctly, he's measured on whether we're getting 532 pieces out a night. So we built the transfer case, minus one part, which is a problem. Um, the next night, I got uh, called in to come in and work for double time. I learned economics at a very young age. So double time, double pay, to come in and tear down 532 transfer cases, awesome. And then the following day was actually a Sunday, so we got called in again, and we got paid triple time to rebuild those transfer cases, which potentially could be why Chrysler cars can be expensive at times. Um, now, you're thinking to yourself, that would never happen. You know, that's, that's manufacturing. That would never happen in our world. Here's, here's the problem. It does. Uh, you know, we constantly are having a lot of rework, and we can't visualize our work. One of the things you can see on the assembly line when we have work in progress, you can see those physical products. We have knowledge work. You can't actually see all of those. Um, but the damage is equally, if not worse, right? So having multiple things in progress, not managing to the theory of constraints and creating rework is causing us huge delays in our system delivery, as well as quality. This is Planet Labs. Again, I'm a huge fan. They have an entire approach that they talk about for agile manufacturing. Um, but they release new designs, and they're able to launch, like I said, every three months. So they've completed 14 iterations on their satellite design since 2012. Now, I had a great time and a good experience at Lockheed, but I can tell you, we didn't have anything even close to that fast ever, all right? So these guys do a really good job at iterating on designs, minimizing rework, and managing that work in progress. Cadence and synchronization. Again, this comes out of, um, how many of you guys have had a chance to read uh, Don Reinertsen's Principles of Product Development Flow? Never mind. But it's a really good book. Highly recommend it. Um, and he's got a lot of mathematics that actually show why certain things work. And one of the things we want to do for large-scale teams that are building cyber-physical systems, especially when they're, they're located in multiple places, is put them on a common cadence, a heartbeat, and synchronize them, right? Because we don't want individual portions of the system building up. We want to build up the system. Now for manufacturing, the number one priority is to reduce variability, remove all variability. You guys agree with that? So for product development, it's a little different. I want to exploit good variability and I want to remove bad variability. And that's much harder. So one of the things that doing this does is it removes noise from the system. It allows me to actually be able to see those variations and identify whether it's good or bad. Um, is it something that I can innovate on or is it something that's bad variability we may need to remove from the system? So, you know, cadence and synchronization removes that noise. All right, and here's an example, right? So building up a car and you can see here I've got my enclosure team, my PCB team, my image sensors, FPGAs, they're all on a common cadence with key integration points 
to build up a system. This is another good book. Um, it's Dante Oscarwald's The Lean Machine, and it talks about how he really improved the delivery of Harley, right? So the delivery of motorcycles. Integrating early and often. Uh, again, I don't think I'm telling you anything new, but how many of you guys think this happens as a normal part of business? Like we, we often say that we want to integrate frequently, but I find even, even with just my software teams, right, everybody's working on their own machine, works on my machine, not necessarily doing continuous integration, even though we talk about CI, CD everywhere. Um, and it's even worse once we get to things that have hardware, software, and firmware, right? It's very easy to stay in our lane and our stovepipe and build up product. It's much harder to get everybody together and to integrate it. So we really want to integrate as often as we can. Now, I say this and I know it, uh, but when uh, Suzette and I were actually writing the book, we're both on travel a lot. And lo and behold, we both had downloaded a copy off of you know, Google Docs of the book to work on on planes, etc. Literally two weeks, we both done lots of work in, in chapters, and guess what? We had to merge. I was like, nobody's even gonna believe this. So even though I know that you need to integrate early and often, we had to go through the pain of merging. And let me tell you, it's not that easy with Google Docs, right? It just doesn't work that well. Um, so even though we know vegetables are good for us and dessert is not, we don't always follow it. Uh, here, we're looking at things like building up an MVP, minimum viable product, and then the next viable product, right? And you can see here, how I'm building up my, my rocket over time. It doesn't mean that every team's integrating every time, some integrate slower than others, but you only go as fast as your slowest integration point. Here's Alton Labs. Um, and again, they show both their software team, their um, mechanical engineering team, and their EE teams, their regular integration, increments and how they're integrating all of the time. So not separately, not I'm building my software here, I've got my firmware here, we're gonna, we're gonna plan a big integration point. They're on a cadence, they're integrating all the time, allowing them to get much faster and learn much quicker. Shift left. Uh, Probably many of you guys have heard this term before, but when we say shift left, don't just shift left test, shift left security, shift left safety, shift left compliance. Begin with your constraint. Um, so for many of the programs that I've worked, we have a tendency to build up, again, a lot of product and then validate it later. Now it could be that we're getting our, um, our test system's too late, or we think that we can build compliance in afterwards, but we want to, and it's much faster, to build it in from the start, all right? Um, one of the things that I had the opportunity to do is we had an additive manufacturing team and they'd built this old school Excel spreadsheet that basically looked at risk, <coughs> looked at requirements from a risk perspective. I've worked a lot of proposals and built, you know, a lot of responses to those proposals uh, from, from various requirements. And one of the things that it allowed me to do is look at a whole bunch of requirements for this system that looked completely reasonable. They looked, they looked good. They didn't look bad at all. Um, but I thought, hey, I'll just play with this tool, try it out. Um, when I got done, I found that actually 32% of the requirements I had were not testable. They seemed like they were good, but once I had to actually determine how I was gonna test them, it, I, 
I was able to ask questions. Now, typically, we would have found this out much later. Again, we'll get the system to work, but we've got rework that gets us there. Here, I was able to reduce time in schedule exponentially by understanding how we're going to validate the solutions earlier. Another thing I typically do with my teams is when we kick off anything, software, systems, etc., cetera, um, we build out hacker personas. Uh, most of the engineers that I have are very good at knowing how to build the system, not always right there with how somebody else is going to use the system in a way that you hadn't intended. So building up hacker personas. Anything you can do to shift the constraint first is going to allow us to reduce time and increase quality. Formula One knows this, and so here you can see McLaren talks about digital twins, and they shift everything left. Now, funny story about this, I actually used this slide um, at the DevOps Summit, and I had a different car because I'm not a car person, and all Formula One cars look the same to me. But I've got McLaren at the bottom, and somebody comes up after my presentation. They said, you know, Robin, that's it's a cool slide, but that's not a McLaren. So I've been able to fix it. I think this is a McLaren now, so we're, we're good. But yeah, leave it to me to get up on stage and like have the wrong car. However, I am a huge fan of, of Formula One, their digital twin technology, and their, their innovation, they, it's just amazing. I highly recommend you go out to their website and just review some of the, the techniques they do to optimize the speed of the vehicles. Apply a growth mindset. Now this seems completely logical too, right? But it's harder than you think, all right? So um, typically, when I'm working, you know, large systems, I'm always going against the grain. I'm trying to get leadership to operate in a different way. I'm trying to get them to iterate, all of these things. Um, most of the executives, let's say at Lockheed Martin, became executives because they were very good engineers, right? So when they were building systems, they were very good at it. And when we come along 10, 15, 20 years later and say, hey, how about we do things differently? it actually uh, is, is almost personal to them, right? They, they don't want to change. So, you know, one of the things I try to focus on is, you know, not that you were doing anything wrong before, but we've got better tools. So when I was a kid, I had an eight-party line. I'm sure that most of you have no idea what that means, but it meant that I could hear everybody's business in the entire neighborhood. It was an awesome telephone. I could just stand next to it, hear what's going on. It was, it was terrific. Now, it was good then, but I still use my iPhone now, right? So again, change happens. And so when we're looking at applying a growth mindset, we have to remember that we're continuously learning. And even though I know this, just a couple years ago, Team Topologies came out. It's a new book, and it talks about how to work with um, different types of teams, whether you're a complicated subsystem team or a feature team or a platform team, etc. Now, the first thing I did when I look at this book is I was like, oh, what are they even doing? I have been telling everybody we need cross-functional feature teams for the last 10 years. And then I realized my mistake. I'm doing the same thing. Um, so, you know, it's, it's not a one-time growth mindset. It's a constantly questioning what you think you know because it's changing. Now, one of those companies that's obviously pretty good at this is SpaceX. Um, they talk about their, their RUD, their you know, rapidly unscheduled uh, you know, decomposition or whatever it is. Um, and they congratulate their engineers because they're learning something. Now, I know not everybody agrees with this, but it is demonstrating a growth mindset. So if you want to use principles like this, here is a mechanism to get started, right? Creating strategic alignment, delivering at the speed of relevance. 
and basically we mapped out all of the different principles to this. Over the last five years, we've written a number of papers uh, through IT Revolution. So Gene Kim um, is the publisher for that. He wrote the Phoenix Project, the Unicorn Project, the, the DevOps Handbook, things like that. Um, and he has sponsored a lot of these papers. Most of the work that I've done really uh, talks about not just the software piece, but how do I deliver a system piece, right? So cyber systems engineering, model-based systems engineering, digital transformation. Um, one of the things that I, I constantly see is, you know, every company has an agile initiative. They have a cyber initiative. They have a cloud initiative. They've got a digital transformation initiative. They've got a model-based systems engineering initiative. Now we've got an artificial intelligence initiative. Um, really, I think we should have a build better systems faster initiative and use all the tools in our toolbox to do those. And with that, um, here is a QR code if you want to get the first chapter of the book and, and read it for free. And um, I would love any feedback. So if you want to reach out to me on LinkedIn um, or anything like that, uh, say, hey, it's good, it's bad, you missed huge gaps here, um, you forgot all of this stuff, I would absolutely welcome that. I am a huge fan of feedback and a lot of passion for how we can deliver systems that are safe and secure at what I refer to as the speed of relevance, right? So not continuous all the time, speed of relevance, speed of need. So depending on what we're building, it may depend or determine, you know, how frequently we need to actually have that. All right, and with that, I hope you have a couple questions. I know you're tired, but even if you just ask one, it'll make me feel better. Thanks. So given software is always changing and getting bugs updated in the cybersecurity space, how can it most effectively be integrated into these systems going forward? <laughs> Open source, so because <laughs> I'm thinking of. Yes, um, so I don't actually have the answer for that. I did listen this morning where a gentleman said, hey, make sure you always have the latest kernel, otherwise you're unsafe. I, I agree with that. Make sure that you're, you're, you're constantly keeping your system current. Make sure that we're validating, um, but there's not one answer. Like, we even had you know folks that are like, well, the SBOM will do it. Well, it's a lot of material, it's a lot of data, but are we really using it? So, TBD, like let's keep working on it. Uh, I guess I have two questions that are pretty closely related. The first question is some of the changes, I mean, very reasonable, like when you talked about going from kind of test and eng and whatever to organizing around the value, but I mean, doing that, especially at a company like Lockheed, I imagine that would require buy-in at like an extremely high level. And there would be a lot of people like super angry and upset about you like destroying their testing fiefdom and whatnot. So I'm kind of curious how you, I mean, over 28 years managed that and like, I mean, were you just empowered by like the CEO to go piss people off? And then the, the second question is, you know, given that you were successful, it seems like as part of this change, has this movement in the industry changed how contracts are negotiated or anything like going from the kind of like, we're just going to assume it's here's the five-year plan and we're just going to magically do it to learning about things, et cetera. So good questions. No, I definitely wasn't empowered to piss people off. However, I did it every day. Um, I'm definitely a, um, a disruptor and you know, I, at times felt like I was just banging my head against the wall. Because you're absolutely right. If you've worked your entire career to finally get to the VP of tests, the last thing you want to do is to give up that power, that, you know, etc. cetera. Um, however, we've really found that you get much better systems that way. Now, what are the things that I typically did? I volunteer a lot at the National Defense Industrial Association. Um, in COSI, et cetera. Uh, 
And I worked a lot with the government who really wants to get systems faster and in some cases um, help them kind of write policy that actually forced our leaders because no I mean sometimes they listen lots of times you know I, I got the Heisman uh, so I I get that um, have they come around by now like is that change thoroughly it's 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 made a huge yes so it's not as fast as I like if you were to look at you know because again I had my first agile project um, in 2002, because the intelligence agency started requiring it. It's not because we're bleeding edge. Um, and we've made a lot of progress since 2002. Do I still run into problems? Absolutely. Talking to F-35 leadership, they were like, nope, we're doing this, we're doing this. Um, honestly, they, the, the JPO and the Air Force don't get along in themselves. It's almost you know, impossible. Um, I think you just have to keep trying. The other thing that's helped a lot is, I know that you may not know what this is, but it's called the Government Accountability Office, or the GAO, and the reports from the GAO have been consistent on we have to go faster and we have to get cheaper. And the way to do that, their belief, is iterative and incremental. Uh, the other question was, has this influence, like, has this change in the industry changed how contracts are structured and how kind of deals are made? So, yes, a hundred percent, no. Uh, what I will tell you is within the U.S. we have what's called the FAR cone of contracting, which has like a bajillion different contracts. Um, we have opened up the aperture for people to try other contracts, multiple different types. Now, I would say that I could use almost any type of contract, and I know not everybody agrees with that, and still leverage a lot of the agile practices, but obviously the most flexible ones are kind of what we would refer to as an IDIQ, these short-term contracts where I, I do something, I validate it, and then I get the next contract. Um, so we are making progress, and I was recently helping with what's called DOD 5000, 85 DOD 5085 is primarily for weapon systems, and that is the the um, updates or feedback that we gave. So with that, I'm done. But thank you so much. I really appreciate you guys coming to hear my talk.